the impact of screens on sleep. You know, people are exposing their eyes to this stream of photons from these objects that basically tells your brain, stay awake, it's not time to go to sleep yet. So it's 10 p.m., it's 11 p.m., it's 12 p.m., you're checking for email, you're looking for text, you're doing all these things. That light beams in you. It tells your brain, don't secrete melatonin yet. It's not time for sleep. And you're up at 12, 30, you're up at one, you're checking some more because you're up after all, why shouldn't you check? Now, you go to bed at one, you wake up at six to get ready for work, that's five hours of sleep. We now know that what sleep is likely doing is allowing your active neurons to rest, which is fine, but more than that, the supportive cells called glial cells are now cleaning up the toxins that the neurons produce. And if you don't get from seven to nine hours of sleep, you just get five, the toxins remain there for over 95% of people. There are a small percentage of people who are genetically different, they don't need that much sleep, but for the vast majority of us, we need seven to nine hours of sleep. So even though it's like a badge of courage, I only had three hours of sleep last night and I'm working today, it makes your attention falter, your memory is impaired, your ability to think through problems is challenged, your insulin even that helps regulate your metabolism is turned upside down so you're more likely to gain weight from what you eat and eat more. And then, if that weren't enough, it's actually toxic to the connections in your cells. So, in your brain. So what you wanna do is prioritize sleep. Shut off your screens, let's say by 9 p.m. Give yourself an hour at least before you're going to bed and keep those screens off. It's a serious, serious problem for everyone and we can do something about it by actually actively deciding that's what we're gonna do is take care of this aspect of the digital domain. We need to understand that the brain is actually an organ that, just like the skin, is the interface between the inner world and the outer world. And when you have digital things like apps or games or interactive media or even social media where you're actually engaging them rather than just watching a television set that is streaming stuff at you, when you have something that allows you to interact with it, it actually engages the brain in a very different way. One way we can understand how the brain develops and what it's driven to do is be involved in something called contingent communication. And what that is, is I send a signal out from inside this body, it originates, and I stream it out, whether it's words I say, motions I have, or things I do in my writing. Whatever I'm doing, I'm sending out a signal. This signal is basically information that's carried in various forms of energy, like light energy for what you see, or you know, when you're hearing what I'm saying, it's air molecules moving. In all these different ways, I can even tap on keys and send signals out to you through a text or an email. We send out signals to the world. Then the receiving part is in a timely and effective manner, I need to get a signal back after I've sent it out and if it's timely and effective, then we call that contingent communication. When that digital world detects your signal and can respond to your signal, even like giving you points for aiming an, a, a shooting object and you got the right place, you got more points than if you missed, it's detecting what you did and it's rating you based on that. So at a very basic level, that's a form of contingent communication it's responding to something you did. That's really huge. And our reward circuit of the brain, starting in an infancy, is actually giving us a surge of dopamine, the chemical that is mediating this reward circuitry. So it feels good, it feels right, we want more of it. And even things that can get addicting can revolve, we need more dopamine, we need more, we need more. With a game, of course, there's a very sophisticated strategy to go beyond just contingent communication and draw a person in to develop skills so they're rewarded for their skill development, for having interaction with other players so you actually have a sense of social camaraderie, and then to continually advance in the levels that games are so 
beautiful at, at attaining and pulling us in. And so the game designer can creatively pull me in in a rewarding way where, especially if I'm learning skills that are helpful, it's actually a win-win situation. Social media is a fascinating new human phenomenon and when we look at it deeply from a brain point of view, when we start with the foundation that the brain is actually the social organ of the body, we can understand why social media and brain functions would go hand in hand. That is, the reason social media took off in this last 10 years is because the brain is social and people really want to connect with each other. And then, once social media was designed and keeps on creating itself, then the social media, in fact, is going to be shaping the brain so that the brain is responsive to culture. And in one of our research centers at UCLA, what we are able to show is that cultural experiences, that is, messages sent out in society that are mediated through communication, either one-on-one -on -one or mass media communication, actually shape the actual structure of the brain. And so it's a two-way street. The brain created social media and social media shapes the brain. One of the simple things I think that social media does is it brings us back at least to a feeling on one level that we're having the connections that we evolved to have. It's a great question, you know, uh, is social media replacing our relationships or is it adding to it? From a brain point of view, the difference between, let's say, email and social media versus face-to-face -face interaction is very interesting. So studies, for example, that have shown what it's like when you actually are with someone face-to-face, -face, where you have eye contact, you're sharing facial expressions, there's a tone of voice you can hear, the posture of the person, the gestures, the timing of what they do, the intensity of what they respond with. Those seven signals, and those are eye contact, facial expression, tone of voice, posture, gestures, timing, intensity. If you memorize those, it's really useful because then you'll see what texting, what email, and what most social media actually is lacking. Now, when you look at what area of the brain both sends out those nonverbal signals and receives them and makes sense of them, it's the right hemisphere of the brain. And the right hemisphere of the brain is much more closely connected to the lower regions, so the higher right areas are connected to the lower regions of the brain, and those lower regions work with the body itself to create our emotions, to give us the felt texture of lived life. So one deep concern that I have as a developmental theorist and a developmental clinician is that the more and more people spend time not using nonverbal signals, and instead use mostly verbal ones, that is, text with language that has this linear way of being distributed, you're activating primarily your left hemisphere, which in the brain is much more distant from the lower areas that help mediate emotion with, with the body. And even autobiographical memory is dominant on the right side. So you're much more into just logistics, even thinking about how people are going to care about you or like you is a left brain thing, which is fascinating. It's called social display rules. So from a hemisphere point of view, what I'm deeply concerned about is if social media, email, texting are not actually getting people more face-to-face -face time with each other or getting them in touch with even what's going on inside of them, then the new generation will be much more used to a very surface level of experiencing the world. So there's nothing inherently wrong with social media, but if it is replacing time for face-to-face, -face, then that could be a big problem. One, try to have in your life face-to-face -face time so you have contingent communication going. Number two, your nonverbal signals, both sending them and receiving them, that part of your life should be enriched every day. You should not be just living a left brain life. That is not a very healthy way to live. Number three, finding a way to actually not be in control all the time. That is, to say, 
I'm present for you. I don't know what you're going to say right now. And I don't, I'm not going to have an hour to think about how I'm going to respond to the text. I got to be present. So we have contingency important, number one, nonverbal signals, number two, being present, number three. And I would say number four is consider what it means. And I know this sounds like a almost silly statement to make, but what it means to have a deep relationship with somebody. So often I'll hear people say, oh, that's someone I met online and we have a relationship. I say, well, what kind of relationship is it? Well, they're sharing photographs. And that, in terms of the depth of relationship, might be deep, maybe not. But I think we're confusing social media contacts with friendship. And what's the difference? Friendship involves vulnerability. It involves being open. It involves kindness, where you have to support one another's vulnerability is how I would define kindness. It involves feeling stuff that you never planned on feeling. It involves all those other things we're talking about. So the depth of a relationship is really important. Try to develop deep relationships. And the fact is, you can't have 400 deep relationships. It's just literally, emotionally, not possible. So this is where we get confused by those numbers. So when people say, oh, I've got 500 friends on Facebook, or he's got, in Twitter, he's got thousands of contacts. I go, what does that mean? And we've lost sight of what these deep relationships are. And the fifth thing I would just say is this, by realizing we're all connected with each other, I think social media is doing a wonderful, wonderful thing. I think its potentials are fantastic. What we want to do is find a way to increase empathy and compassion. And this means going beyond just a friendship, which is wonderful, but realizing we can use social media for a positive end to really realize that we can put more compassion in the world and help each other as best we can in collaborative ways. The biggest issue about tech and parenting is that we use tech to distract our kids from connecting with us as their parents, with their siblings, and with other kids. That's not okay. I mean, even studies of certain things that had been claimed to improve language development show that they actually they impede language development because they're being used instead of relational connections. And so what you might think is stimulating is actually distracting to a child's social emotional development, especially in the early three, four years of life. You know, when a kid is 10 and has a lot of things going on, has developed these abilities, I'm not so worried about it, but it concerns me gravely when you see one-year-olds and two-year-olds, you know, getting used to a flat world from a screen. And that is a big, big concern. Now, if that world were showing the social emotional connections and we could build that into the daily routine for a three-year-old, four-year-old, beautiful. Uh, but we want to make sure we're really developing the core capacity for insight, empathy, and literally integration, honoring our differences and promoting linkages. That's a fundamental part of contingent communication, nonverbal sharing, ways of knowing yourself, of really feeling deeply connected in relationships. That's what parents need to support in their children's development. Insight, empathy, and integration are what mindsight means. What's wonderful about mindsight is it actually allows you to not just sense the mind, this mindsight, it actually allows you to bring the mind to a place of stability, clarity, and well-being. So, Integration is actually the root of happiness. It's the root of health. It's even the root of creativity. Integration within a relationship can be extremely creative because what you're doing is you're saying, well, I have this feeling and belief. Let me know your feeling and belief, and then let's link by communicating about it. And that's basically the simplest way you can describe what is a healthy, deep relationship all about. And within myself for insight, I can actually say, well, what is going on inside of me? And the ways that you learn this would be, can I reflect inwardly and sense, for example, what is my body feeling? What mindful awareness is, it's allowing a part of you that senses experience and a part of you that observes your experiencing to be differentiated 
and then brought together as a collaborative duo, if you will. There's probably even other areas too. It doesn't take that much to do it. But if we had to say what the outline was, here's what it is. Number one, we need to develop the capacity to focus our attention. And a useful one to start with is your breath. So there's a breath practice that's found in almost every culture. And if you just take three minutes a day, focus on your in-breath when your in-breath is there, the sensation of your out-breath when the out-breath is there, and when you get distracted, just bring your attention back to the breath. If you do that three minutes a day, it's a great starting place. Number two is what's called open awareness. We have a practice called the wheel of awareness, which consists of first sensing the breath and imaging a wheel, and then systematically taking this metaphoric spoke from the hub as I let the breath go, and I focus that spoke of attention on the first segment of the rim, which is what I see, open my eyes, look around, what I hear, maybe spending about 30 seconds on each, what I smell, what I taste, what I feel with my skin all over my body, take a deep breath, move the spoke around to the next segment of the rim, which represents the interior of my body, the different sensations from my muscles and bones throughout the whole body, head, torso, limbs, and then I go internally, genitals, intestines, lungs, heart, and then I take a deep breath, move the spoke over to the third segment of the rim, and this is of course done slowly, uh, where now I'm gonna be open to whatever kind of feelings, thoughts, images, memories, intentions, hopes, dreams might emerge, just a kind of bring it on attitude. And then, take a deep breath, I take the spoke and I imagine sending it out from the hub and instead of going to the rim, I bend it around and aim it right back into the hub where I'm able to experience what awareness of awareness feels like. And the third aspect of developing these skills is kindness toward yourself and others. In the wheel practice, the final segment of the rim allows you to develop that to develop a sense of care and connection to entities, people, animals, plants, the whole planet, besides what's in your body. And when people do this, what they report is this deep sense of well-being. Because the fact is, we are all interconnected. Doing a daily reflective practice, like the Wheel of Awareness practice, for example, stabilizes attention, accesses open awareness, teaches you kindness towards self and others on a daily basis, so that you have health in your mind, health in your body, health in your relationships. It's a win-win-win situation. The issue is, can you get yourself to begin?